Welcome everyone to the uh, the second edition of our ongoing online seminar series on Bayesian machine learning at scale. So I'm Mike Artreau uh, with the Crypto AI Lab in Paris, who is sponsoring this event. Um, just a couple of announcements before we get to Jake's talk. So we've got uh, two upcoming talks with registrations that are now open. So the first is on June 24th. It's uh, Aki Vintari's talk on the use of reference models and variable selection. And then uh, John Orman's talk on July 1st on cake priors for Bayesian hypothesis testing and extensions via variational Bayes. Uh, so be sure to register for those talks coming up in the next two weeks. Um, I think David has posted the link. And so today we've got uh, pleased to have Jake Hoffman from Microsoft Research New York. So Jake is a senior principal researcher with a focus on computational social science and in particular applications that involve uh, novel computational tools and statistical methods uh, applied to large scale social data. And today he's gonna to be presenting his work, recent work on how visualizing inferential uncertainty can mislead readers about treatment effects and scientific results. And uh, so we'd like the participants, if you have questions, to enter your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and we will pause periodically to, let, to answer a few of those questions, and then we'll have another uh, period for further questions at the end of the talk uh, for about 15 minutes. Uh, so to be sure you're to enter your questions in the Q&A box when you have them. And now I'll turn it over to Jake. Great. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, can you hear me and see the slides and maybe even see me okay? Yeah. Yes, and yes. Okay, great. Um, so, um, so I'm really glad to to uh, to be here to be able to present this work. Um, as Mike said, it's about inferential uncertainty, um, but I have a slightly different, less wordy title for it, which is the effect of not communicating effect sizes. Um, it is joint work with Dan Goldstein, who's a colleague at Microsoft Research. Uh, Jessica Holman, who's at Northwestern, um, and also Yesel Kim, who will be uh, starting a faculty position at University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, this coming year. She was an intern with us last year. So uh, the paper that, that Mike mentioned is joint with, uh, with Dan and Jessica, and then we have another paper with Yesel, which I'll also talk about a bit. Um, during the talk, I'm going to ask you a poll question. Uh, so we could try to make this a little sort of fun and entertaining for people on the other end. Um, and so if you want to go ahead and preload this link, you won't be able to answer it yet because there'll be a question that doesn't make sense. But if you want to preload it so you can answer it when the time comes, you can go ahead and do that. So that's all the setup for the talk. Uh, the other thing I'll do is apologize right away by saying that, um, you know, we are on a seminar about Bayesian machine learning at scale. And I'm not going to talk about anything Bayesian, barely related to machine learning, uh, and certainly not at scale, at the scale that Critio operates, for instance. Um, so with that apology, I will say, I think I hope that you folks still find this interesting in the sense that I am going to talk a lot about uncertainty and representing and communicating uncertainty, which I think is something that uh, probably all of us are interested in. And there are analogs. I'm going to talk about a lot of sort of frequentist, um, you know, sort of concepts that are communicated to folks. Um, and they're, of course, Bayesian analogs. Um, but all the work we did was sort of starting off in the frequentist domain. And I think we could have a nice discussion afterwards um, about translating these things over into, into the Bayesian domain. So with that, I'll get started. Um, and as I said, we're, I'm going to try to make this a little interactive. So uh, we'll start out by uh, an imagined scenario. This worked a little better a few months ago when it was cold, but try to take yourself back uh, just a little bit to the winter. Imagine you are standing here on uh, beautiful Lake Louise, um, which is full of ice, uh, and um, you are confronted by your arch nemesis in the up and coming sport of boulder sliding, where you slide boulders on ice as far as you can and you have to try to beat your opponent and slide your boulder further than them. Um, and so while you're there, you're in the championship match 
And you're going to, as I said, uh, you're going to face your arch nemesis Blorg. You guys have faced Dorf many, many times before. You and Blorg are equally matched. So um, you have the same skill level, you know, you're dead even in your past competitions. You have one more match coming up, one chance to slide your boulder farther than Blorg. And it's high stakes. There's a winner takes all prize of 250 fictitious ice dollars uh, for you to win uh, if you slide your boulder farther than Blorg in this competition, in this one throw that you have. So, of course, since this is a high stakes situation, you have a coach, right? Your coach tells you that you are allowed to rent a special boulder, a special piece of equipment that slides farther than the standard boulder on average, okay? Uh, it's not guaranteed, it may slide farther, it may slide less far, but on average, it slides farther. And Blorg will use the standard boulder, this regular piece of equipment. Okay? And it's perfectly within the rules for you to use this equipment. It's not like doping. You can rent the special boulder, it's allowed. Um, Blorg will not rent it, and if, you do not rent the special boulder, you will be equally matched with Blur. And so, you know, this is kind of a silly setup, but I want to point out that it's not necessarily as silly as you might think, in the sense that there are choices like this um, that, that people actually face. This is an article from the New York Times that people might have seen from a couple of years ago, where they look at these Nike sneakers called the Vaporfly, uh, Vaporfly 4%, because they're supposed to boost your performance by 4%. Um, and people pay serious money for these things, a couple hundred bucks, um, because they have this uh, crazy carbon fiber sole that's supposed to, uh, you know, improve your performance, right? And so this is actually, you know, in some sense, a, a, a real analog of this type of situation. Um, and so in thinking about this, you probably want some more statistics about the special boulder. Um, and so uh, here's what your coach shows you. Your coach shows you an experiment with a thousand trials, okay, of each of the standard and the special boulder, right? And here are the results, right? The points represent the average and the bars represent two standard errors above and below the mean, okay? So that's what the standard boulder tends to perform at, that's what the special boulder tends to perform at. And here is the question, now you can go load up that survey that I had for folks. The question is, if you were to use the, um, the special boulder, what is the probability that you would win when Blorg used the standard boulder, okay? So, uh, so I'm gonna leave that up there now. I'm gonna give you a moment to type that into your browser. You're gonna go and see a simple form where you can put your estimate. And I'm gonna start some fun music so it feels like a real game show and we don't have totally dead air. This is normally much more fun when we're in the same room and people shout out answers, um, but we're gonna do the best we can over Zoom. So I'll give you all maybe another 15, 20 seconds. You're just gonna give your probability that you would win if you use the special boulder and Blorg use the standard boulder. I'm gonna ask David or Mike if they happen to be free. Have you guys had time to go over there yet and enter your answers? Let's see. Yes, I got mine in. All right, David's got his in. Yeah. Uh, Mike, Mike's got, got his in. in as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop. You guys have got it in. Hopefully, other people have gotten it in. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, you weren't. We weren't all in the same room to hear each other. But I've done this um, with. Uh, with lay people. I've done this with scientists in our lab. Um, I've done this with other online audiences. And, um, you know, every time we do this poll, um, we kind of get similar types of answers where people are somewhere above the sort of 75% chance. Sometimes they're in the 99% chance. Sometimes they do very clever things like try to compute, you know, one minus the CDF of the normal distribution uh, for the difference between these things. And my experience um, is that sort of the more stats training people have, the longer they take to answer this question. Uh, 
uh, but it doesn't really correlate with how correct they are. Um, so what I want to do is I want to give you a slightly different version of this quiz. Okay, so pencils down. If you haven't answered, please don't answer past this point. Um, here is a slightly different version of the quiz. There are again a thousand trials of each of the standard and special boulders. The points show the average, but now the, the bars show two standard deviations around the mean. And so looking at this, I could have given you this data and asked you what's the probability that you would win on a single throw if you use the special boulder and Blorg used the standard boulder. Right. And what you know, we found through lots of experiments and lots of informal polling is that people give a very different answer when they see this. They look at these, these kind of represent the distributions, and they say, well, it's actually not a really big difference. And you know, it's, it's hard to say with any certainty that you would really win there. Right? And of course, what I've done here is I've tricked you um, in a sense. These are two different visualizations of the same data. Okay, the correct answer is 57%. Uh, so the probability that you would win with the special boulder is 57% if Blorg used the standard boulder. Um, that number is sometimes called probability of superiority or common language effect size, or for those of us in, in the machine learning world, um, it's called the AUC. It's the probability that a randomly selected sample from one distribution uh, ranks higher than, than from the other. Um, and so that 57%, right, um, is probably not the answer people gave to the first question in the poll. We'll find out because I can take a look at that and maybe we can email that out later. Um, I wish I could do it in real time and you could all hear each other's votes, but that's the best we can do. Um, and so, you know, what, what's going on here, right? Um, what's going on is that error bars are confusing and whether they're frequentist error bars or Bayesian incredible intervals or, or whatever, they're confusing. Um, it could be that people don't know the difference between different types of error bars, or they don't notice the difference, right? And these are, these are different reasons error bars are confusing, right? So um, I showed you one plot that had standard errors and another plot that had standard deviations, right? Um, and you probably know the difference between those things. You may not, you may have at some point and may have forgotten. Um, you might not have noticed that the first time that I showed it to you, I was showing you standard errors instead of standard deviations, right? Um, these problems come up a lot in practice. This is actually, um, you know, a paper in Nature from a couple of years ago uh, where they actually went through the literature and looked at how often people screw this up. Um, sometimes, and, and uh, the, the misinterpretations are because the authors themselves don't even say what type of error bars are on a plot. Um, and then other times, you know, people will say it, but they'll, they'll misinterpret it. Um, this is actually an example of a, of a retracted paper um, on a study uh, for blood, a randomized control trial for blood pressure treatment, um, where what they did was take a bunch of randomized control trials and do a meta-analysis. And when the authors read off the results from one of the publications they were including in the meta-analysis, they read off standard errors, but treated them like they were standard deviations, um, which sort of invalidated the entire meta-analysis and they had to retract the paper, right? Um, so these things actually happen. Um, and so I would say, you know, in some sense, um, you know, you can view it as, oh, well, I just didn't notice, but I think in practice, there's a lot of external validity to the fact that people just don't notice, right? And there's a good reason for that. I don't think, you know, the statistics community has done itself any favors um, because we have similar phrases, standard error shown here and standard deviation shown here, right? They're different by one word. They both start with standard, so that's already bad. Um, they have the same visual marker almost all the time. You draw this error bar, um, you know, above and below. Um, so you're not showing a different visual marker. You're not using very different words, but they have very different meanings, right? Um, on the left, what I'm kind of showing you is inferential uncertainty, uh, some uncertainty about my inference on the mean for each condition. Whereas on the right, I'm showing you information about outcome variability. And so I think this is a point where I want to, you know, I want to make clear, even though I'm showing you the frequentist version of these things, um, the idea that these different notions of uncertainty and variability are often communicated and not well distinguished between uh, I think are, are, this, is a, this is a very important, important difference, right? 
Um, and this can happen regardless of, you know, the exact methodology behind how you're computing these intervals, right? Um, and so just to dive into that a little deeper, right? I think this is all review for everyone, but let's do it because um, I think it's I think it's illuminating, right? Standard deviations capture variation in individual outcomes, right? It's just the square root of the variance, right? And when you look at these, you can kind of see a measure of effect size very clearly. How and by effect size, I mean how different are two underlying distributions, right? Here, you know, you're kind of seeing 95%, a range of 95% of the data in the treatment and 95% of the data uh, in the control. And so from that, if you wanted to do something like compute the difference in means compared to the standard deviation, um, that's a nice standardized measure of effect size. It's Cohen's D, which people are probably familiar with the difference in the mean between the treatment and the control divided by the standard deviation, right? And here you would get a sense that that effect size is not super large. Um, Cohen's D is sort of unit list, it's a number of standard deviations. Um, and so sometimes um, it's a little more intuitive to think about this probability of superiority, which again is that probability, if I picked a random observation from the treatment, what's the probability that that uh, observation would score higher on the outcome than a randomly sampled uh, observation from the control, right? And again, that's the AUC or the common language effect size, which in this case, as shown here, is 57%. So standard deviations emphasize effect size. What do standard errors emphasize? They really emphasize statistical significance, right? So just so we remember, um, standard errors capture our inferential uncertainty in our estimate of the mean. So the standard error is the population standard deviation divided by root n. As we make a sample bigger and bigger and bigger, we can get more and more certain about the mean. And so we can shrink these bars down um, as sort of as, as far as we want, as long as we get uh, a big enough sample, we can become very, very certain about our estimate of the mean. Um, and so, you know, is the difference in means large compared to sampling variability is what kind of is encoded here. We've taken a large enough sample that we can be pretty darn sure um, that you know, it would be unlikely to see these if they came from the same distribution, right? Um, and you know, people will measure this by something like a t-statistic, which uh, you know, is the difference in means over the standard error. Right, and so by making that standard error very small, you can drive up the t statistic and drive down the p value and get statistical significance. And I'm sure we all have our different reasons for not liking reports of statistical significance in the frequentist sense. Um, but the idea here is, if you run a large enough study, you'll find statistically significant differences even for small effects. Right, and so to dig into that a little bit um, and to belabor a point, which I think will come back and serve as well a little later in the talk. Uh, I'm gonna pull an example from uh, Jacob Cohen, which he used actually in his 1988 textbook on effect sizes, when he sort of said, hey, listen people, we should really be paying attention to effect sizes and not statistical significance. Um, and this is a great example that our uh, co-author Ye Sol actually found in his textbook when he introduces Cohen's D. So remember Cohen's D is the difference in means over the standard deviation. The example he uses is heights of 15 year old and 16 year old girls. So what's depicted here in red is a distribution of the heights of 15 year old girls in the US with an average of 170 and a st uh, centimeters and a standard deviation of 15 centimeters. And 16 year old girls have an average of 174 centimeters with a standard deviation of 15 centimeters in blue. So the Cohen's D there is about a quarter of a standard deviation it happens to also be a 57% chance if you selected a random 16 year old from this distribution and a random 15 year old from the red distribution, uh, there's a 57% chance that the 16 year old would be taller than the 15 year old. Right? And so that's that probability of superiority again. Um, and a fun fact about this is that she actually, Ye Sol actually found this after we had set up um, that, that study that I showed you with the 57%. So it just so happens uh, happy accident that uh, we had chosen the same type of effect size um, uh, to look at that Cohen used in his book. Uh, and so now to, to, to really nail this point home, I want to say, okay, this is the true distribution, but of course, you know, you never have access to the population distribution. You only get access to samples. So let's take a look at what would happen as you 
uh, as you start to sample from this distribution. Let's say you come along and you sample 25 people, okay? Um, and in each group, you sample 25 15-year-olds, 25 16-year-olds, you compute the mean and two standard errors for a 95% confidence interval, and you show those here, okay? And if you're you know, a good frequentist, you'll probably run a t-test and say, well, you know, the p-value is kind of high. I can't reject the null that these came from the same distribution. Um, you know, you might do inference by eye and look at the overlap in the error bars and conclude kind of the same thing, right? Um, and so you realize that you're underpowered and you need to do uh, sort of a bigger survey. So you sample now randomly 116-year-olds and 115-year-olds. So you've upped your sample size by four. You cut down your standard errors in half. Um, now you get a statistically significant result uh, where you can say, well, I think it's unlikely that these came from the same distribution, right? Um, and maybe you're, you know, a super great scientist who's, you know, really wants to have solid results. And so you up your sample by another factor of four, you sample 400 people, um, you get, uh, you know, these means uh, of 170 and 174 almost exactly, uh, you get very tiny uh, confidence intervals, and of course you get a, an insanely small uh, p-value because it's very unlikely that you would see these two uh, means on these groups if they actually had the same underlying distributions. Okay. Um, and so what's going on here, right? The standard errors and the p-values decrease with more data. That's that square root n in the denominator coming in, um, despite the same underlying effect size, right? It's still the case back here that the variability, the outcome variability in the heights of 15 year olds is what it is. And the variability in 16 year olds is what it is. And that variation is pretty large relative to the mean difference, right? And so, you know, if you, if you come back and think about all the data underlying these, right, you get a very different sense of what's going on, right? And so only reporting these means and the inferential uncertainty really hides the outcome variability under there. And I want to go one step further. You'll notice I kind of kept everything on, on this fixed scale here um, from 140 to 200 centimeters um, because I knew about the variation in the population and I knew I was going to show you all the points later. But of course, what might a published paper show? A published paper might show this, right? Here's the mean and the confidence interval, the mean and the confidence interval. Um, and they might show you this result. And I think it's very, very hard cognitively to look at this result, right, even knowing that there's sort of 400 people represented here, um, to really think about the outcome variability in those 400 people, right, and compare that to a plot where you show that outcome variability. And it's, I think it's very hard to say that you would look at the top plot and get the impression that the bottom plot gives you, right. Um, and it, in a nutshell, that's kind of the point of the entire paper, uh, two papers that I'm really talking about today. And I think if you if you leave with that, um, then you know my job is kind of done, right? Which is that when you when you communicate results in this top format, I think you miss a lot. Even though in theory you could take these error bars, you could blow them up by square root of 400, and you could get a sense of this variability. I think cognitively it's very hard to do. Um, and so, so that's kind of the main point. I think what I'll do right here, because I'm going to transition into, um, you know, talking about the actual set of experiments we ran. I'm going to check in with Mike, who I think has been monitoring the Q&A, and just see if there's anything that's come up so far to clarify or, or comment on what's been said before I move on with the actual experiment. How are we doing uh, on questions, Mike? Uh, so far, I don't see anything. There's no open questions. But I, I have a okay. question for you. And, yes. Um, and maybe you'll get to this, but how would you, do you have any recommendations on how to present results more accurately to try to compensate for this phenomenon? Yeah, um, and I'll get to that towards the end. Um, a very short, so first I want to just get a sense of what the biasing effect of seeing this version is. And then um, I'll show versions like this and alternatives that I think are better. Um, and uh, and uh, both ones we tested and ones that are sort of newer and more interesting that, that we've learned about since the ones we've tested. Cool. Um, okay. okay, so since we, we don't have any other questions. I might, I might throw one in as well. Just saying yes, please. Um, 
so you said it wasn't a Bayesian talk, but I think maybe it is a bit because what if I was like, to me, like there's a difference between the posterior distribution, the predictive distribution. Yes. So if I'm writing my stand code, I've written generated quantities block. I'm likely to see both yep. of these and see these things are different. And it seems that would be a, a fairly neat route into, into, into solving this problem. Yes, I think that would be great to say, look at the credible interval for the posterior on a parameter versus the predictive distribution. And I think you have the exact analog. Um, and, you know, I think. But perhaps go possibly ahead, yeah. predictive checks and things like this. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think all these things translate over nicely. Um, and I think it'd be, you know, it'd be nice to confirm that. Um, that the same effects happen. My suspicions are that they would, um, but you know, in this paper, we only tested the frequent dispersions. But I think there are nice analogs. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, great. So, okay, I'll forge on words and tell you what we actually did because I think, to me, this kind of makes the conceptual point. But of course, we'd like to have data to back that up. Okay. So the motivation is that the call for reporting effect sizes is, is not new. It's been going on for decades. Um, there have been some small shifts in reporting effect sizes, but visualizations primarily emphasize statistical significance. In other words, people are sometimes putting a Cohen's D or something like that uh, in, the, in a paper, but the figures are usually showing standard errors. And I'll, I'll touch back on why I think that is a little later. So the research question here is how much do different visualizations of statistical results affect the perceived effect sizes of those uh, results, right? Um, so there's going to be a lot of, you know, sort of meta and self-referential stuff going on here. We're going to present effect sizes. We're going to measure the effect of presenting those effect sizes. It's going to get a little hairy, so please pop in and ask questions on the Q&A if something gets confusing. Um, so here's what we actually did. Um, we did things with mechanical turkers. Um, we didn't have access yet uh, to a set of experts. So we looked at lay people. Um, we think this is important because lay people read the results of scientific studies all the time. And that's something that, you know, we're seeing more and more these days uh, as people are trying to decipher, okay, you know, how, how much should I, how much stock should I put in, uh, you know, a new uh, RCT uh, about, uh, you know, a COVID treatment, for instance. Right, so people are getting a, a really harsh education on these things, but how you communicate these things to lay people, I think, is you know is very consequential. Um, and so we had access to a large pool of them. We we included something like 2,400 turkers in all of the experiments I'll show. Um, we basically ran the boulder sliding thing that I did at the beginning. So you all were kind of participants in our experiment, um, but people were randomly assigned to see either the standard error plot or the standard deviation plot. It was the same treatment with different visualizations. And then we measured how much they were willing to pay for the treatment and what they thought their probability of superiority is. So I only talked to you about this probability of superiority. We also, because there was this you know, $250 fictitious prize, um, we asked them how much they were willing to pay. It's kind of like the sneakers, right? We said, um, you know, how much would you be willing to pay for these things if uh, you know, given, given the chart you've seen? Uh, in terms of improving your chance of winning. So everything was pre-registered at as predicted. Um, that's something we've been doing for a few years now and the pre-registration process has been great. Uh, I think has really clarified a lot of our designs and uh, improved our inferences. And if people have not checked out as predicted, I'd just like to throw a plug in there uh, for that or for Open Science Framework or anywhere where you can easily pre-register uh, your study designs, uh, not just for experimental work, but for all kinds of work. Um, and so this is the setup we had. Uh, let me take you through a couple of the screens so you can see what people saw, because I think it's always important to see the exact stimuli. So this is really what we did in the beginning, but just with more detail. Um, I put the red underlines here because those, you know, there's too many words on the slide. This is what I want you to pay attention to. We're in this bold, fictitious boulder sliding situation. You're trying to slide your boulder farther than your competitor. There's a $250 prize. The special boulder tends to slide farther you can rent it and your opponent will not and we want to know what you think of this whole situation right? um, we give you some information we make sure you know that you and your opponent blorg are equally matched and then we give you long text descriptions of what's going on so we say look with a standard boulder you know the past 1000 times you've slid it you've had an average of 100 meters right 
and we give you information about the variation in your sliding distance and our uncertainty in estimating the true average. And we spell out here, and you can read in the paper, um, the details of how we describe this confidence interval to people, because that's always a tricky thing. Uh, but we emphasize that you and Blorg are identical. Then we show you the screen of what the coach shows you, right? The standard boulder and the special boulder. Um, we give you a text description, we link it to the graph, and then we say, what is the most you would be willing to pay to use the special boulder? And it's initialized at the 250, which of course you should not choose. You actually have to move it. You can move it back there if you want, but you have to move it to continue. Um, so you can pay anywhere from $0 to 250. Um, we parrot that back to you. You click continue. Then um, we say two questions. So slightly more complicated than the form you entered. If you were to compete with Blorg 100 times where you had a standard boulder and Blorg had a standard boulder, what's your best estimate of the number of times you would win? So this right here is an attention check to make sure people are paying attention to the fact that you're equally matched with standard equipment. This should be a 50% answer here. Um, and we use that to filter out people um, who are not paying attention. Our results, even if we include the people who are not paying attention, are, are unchanged qualitatively. Um, but this is the real question, which is if you had the special boulder and Blork had the standard boulder, what's your best estimate of the number of times you would win? We phrase things in terms of frequencies instead of probabilities because there's lots of evidence from the psychology literature that people think better in terms of natural frequencies than they do in terms of percentages or probabilities. Um, and then we, we collect those results. So that's, that's the whole experiment in its simplest form. We did a bunch of variations, but that's kind of the simple thing. Um, and let me show you the, 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 the difference, right? The treatment was simply that you were told variation and you were shown standard deviations. Okay, so here's condition A, here's condition B. Of course, none of the red underlining was anywhere. So it's a camera A, camera B, very small difference. Everything else was kind of tightly controlled for. Uh, we have a couple of other conditions um, that I will show in a little bit, but let me just show you the main punchline from these. So, um, you know, the result is people are willing to pay significantly more for the treatment when they see standard error visualization. So here is a plot of our results. Now, this is not a stimuli. We had a, a clever uh, person in a talk once asked me if this was part of the experiment or this was the results of the experiment. This is the results of the experiment. And this is where it gets a little self-referential. Um, this is how much people were willing to pay when they saw standard deviations and how much they were willing to pay when they saw standard errors. Um, they were willing to pay about you know, 56, 57 bucks um, when they saw the standard deviations because they realized that the distributions overlapped a lot, whereas they were willing to pay about 80 on average when they saw the standard errors. And here, I want to be very clear, the standard error bars, the error bars show one standard error in average willingness to pay, from which you can tell that the p-value is very small. We're pretty certain um, that this would not have happened uh, if they came from the same distribution. And I think it would be extremely hypocritical of me to actually show you this plot uh, when I'm talking about showing outcome uncertainty, right? This is the actual standard deviation in willingness to pay in both conditions, right? And so I think if you look at these two, right, first of all, you can read off, you know, more easily an estimate of the Cohen's D, which is around 0.42. Um, I'll put a, an asterisk on that because our friends at Data Colada have done some nice work on showing how hard it is to estimate effect sizes accurately. Here we have over a thousand people in each condition. Um, and so we can do this, I think, reasonably well, but I wouldn't bet my life on this 0.42. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's very hard. I think you would find, if I walked up to you and showed you this set of results versus this set of results, you'd find the first one much more impressive than the second one. Um, maybe after a bunch of time thinking about the fact that these are standard deviations and the previous ones are standard errors, um, you might realize, okay, they're the same thing. Um, but, but that's kind of, you know, a, a punchline of our, of our work. Um, and it's also attention in presenting the work. Um, which I'll talk about a little more later. In terms of probability of superiority, people overestimate that even more. So the average over here was somewhere in the 60s when they saw standard deviations. Uh, when they saw standard errors, they were somewhere in the 85 range uh, or high, the mid 80s range. Uh, and of course, if we show that with means uh, and standard deviations, you see uh, again, there's reasonable overlap. It's actually quite a large effect in terms of convention. So, so Cohen's D um, of about seven 
four or, or three quarters of a standard deviation is actually pretty high. It's on the, on the large side of effects for, for a psychological study. Um, and so, so we're seeing exactly with the lay people what, um, what I've seen uh, in polling, you know, experts and other folks. Um, and so um, we did a bunch of other experiments that I just want to talk about for a second. Um, those weren't the only things we tested. Um, we also varied information in the caption to see if including standard deviation mitigated the effect. So one, one retort you might have to this is to say, hey, you know, I, that's fine. I'm going to keep my plots showing inferential uncertainty and standard errors, but I'll just write standard deviations and effect size in the text. Um, and what we find there is that standard deviations in the text do not um, actually uh, change the overestimate. So people seem to focus on the visual more than they do on the text, even when all the information is there. So we did sort of a two by two where we showed standard deviations and standard errors um, as one manipulation. And then we did whether we provided extra text information or just text pertinent to the figure. Uh, and we did not see big differences there. We also looked at sensitivity to small and large effect sizes. Um, and we do see that. So we do see that in the standard deviation condition, people can tell the difference between you know, a high probability of superiority and a low probability of superiority. So we had one special boulder that instead of shifting you four meters on average would shift you 16 meters on average. And people were willing to pay more for that and they estimated the, the probability of superiority is higher and closer to true uh, when they saw standard deviations compared to standard errors. I'm going to have some coffee so I don't lose my voice. Um, okay, and then we looked at less conventional visualizations. So the two I told you about, whoops, sorry, the two I told you about were uh, standard errors and standard deviations. We also looked at some uh, some different treatments. The first one is standard errors with a rescaled axis. So one thing you might critique this plot for, which I kind of mentioned earlier, is well, you've zoomed in and you made that difference look really big, right? But if you, maybe the magic here is not the bars, but it's just the fact that you can see the full range of the data. Um, and so we told people this represents the range of 95% of the data, um, you know, and this uh, is, is the difference in means, right? Um, and so now you have a hybrid between these two plots. We see that this helps somewhat, but it really doesn't mitigate the effect. Um, we compared this to what I think is a really nice visualization by our co-author Jessica, uh, which she calls HOPS, Hypothetical Outcome Plots. Um, I think this is something that's fun uh, and that could apply in you know, Bayesian land and frequentist land um, equally as well, which is to show samples. I think especially as Bayesians, people are very used to taking samples from their posteriors and, and things like that. Um, and here you're just seeing an encoding of different samples from the standard boulder and the special boulder. And you can see how often the thing on the right is higher than the thing on the left, right? You can kind of visually encode frequencies there. You, you know, you even could see if you had something like paired samples, you know, you'd be able to see correlations in those things. So there's really, I think, a lot of richness here. We found that these performed about the same as standard deviations um, in terms of people's uh, estimates relative to the normative values. So those are the different manipulations we tried in other versions of the experiment. Um, those are all written up in the paper and all the stimuli are available there um, on Open Science Framework for people to look at. Um, we also, at the end, wanted to get a picture, and I think this is something that especially uh, Bayesians might be interested in, uh, of eliciting full probability distributions from participants. So this is some really cool work that uh, my co colleague Dan um, did with uh, Eric Johnson and Bill Sharp uh, way back in 2008, where they wanted to get distributions from people. And so they had basically, um, you know, distribution builder that they created that was uh, allowed people to move around mass and, you know, sort of show what they thought for a distribution. Um, and so we adapted this, we used uh, some really nice code. I wanna plug this because, you know, one of the best things you can get is a tip for a, a, a usable tool here. Quentin Andre, um, who's a UC Boulder, um, has a great JavaScript implementation of this. So, you know, it's so great that Dan said, forget about the version we built, let's, let's use Quentin's version. 
Um, you drop in this JavaScript library and you have um, you know, a situation where you say, okay, if we were to compete with Florg 100 times where you had the standard boulder, how many slides do you think would land at each distance? And you use the plus and minus buttons to populate 100 balls down here in these bins. And when you're done with that, you know, you've specified your distribution for the standard boulder. You can do the same for the special boulder. And we collect those up across all the thousands of people who have done our experiment. Um, and we can get really nice estimates of what was in people's heads. So what I'm going to show you here, focus just on the left. So this is where people saw, saw standard error visualizations. Um, the bars show the aggregates of people's responses, where they place the balls in the bins. Okay. The lines show the true distributions, and the dashes or the dots show the means, the true means. And so what you can see is people are getting the means right, which is sensible. They see the points. Um, and by the way, they're doing this um, after they have seen the visualization. The visualization has gone away. It's disappeared. And they're just presented with this screen of, tell us what you remember. OK, what was in your head? Right? And so you can see they're really underrepresenting the variability here. They draw these very spiky things. It's as if the variability just stays within the bars. right? where they see standard deviations, they actually do pretty well, right? The distributions, the bars that they give are pretty close to the true distribution. And so I think this is a really rich tool if you want to elicit, um, you know, priors or uh, other information from people, uh, you know, in, in some ways very appealing to try to use something like the distribution builder. But I think this gave us uh, even more confidence that our interpretation of what was going on here um, was, was uh, you know, on the mark. Um, and so that kind of sums up everything that was in this first paper with Dan and Jessica. And now I just want to talk uh, very briefly about um, one working paper that I have posted and one uh, in progress set of experiments. Um, so we have other work on communicating effect sizes. Um, as I mentioned, Yesel Kim was the one who found that great, um, you know, analogy of heights. And what we did was we were actually looking for analogies. We, Dan and I have a bunch of work on numerical perspectives to communicate information to people in an easier to understand format. And so we wanted to think about text instead of visualizations because often it's the case in a newspaper article, for instance, that you don't see a plot, but you do see somebody cite some sort of statistic or a margin of error or something like that in a popular piece. And we thought, well, hey, what can we do to give, say, journalists a better way to communicate this uncertainty. And so maybe we can give people you know, analogies, right? Um, so we looked at, uh, we did a within subjects experiment where we first showed people sort of what I did with you. We first showed people the standard errors um, or some written version of that. And then uh, we gave them, and we got an estimate, then we gave them more information we got an updated estimate. And so what you're seeing here on the x-axis, how much better, um, if we tell people, so we did it in the same framework, if we straight up tell them the probability of superiority, then you know this does a good job of reducing their error in willingness to pay relative to the normative value. Um, but it turns out to be just as good to say, Roughly speaking, the special boulder will beat the standard boulder about as often as a randomly selected 16-year-old is taller than a randomly selected 15-year-old. So, uh, you know, in the end, hopefully it was worth it for you to pay attention to that example in the beginning, um, because what we're doing is literally giving people this analogy, and we're finding that it works just as well as this quantitative statement. Um, we tried out some other analogies, like using weather to look at, okay, you know, it's the same as the probability that uh, January 15th will be colder than February 15th, for instance. Uh, that doesn't perform quite as well, we suspect, because we weren't able to personalize that uh, to each individual in the experiment. Um, but kind of showing people probability of superiority, one of these analogies, or telling them about variance information in, in individual outcomes, all kind of do fairly well in reducing that initial error compared to a control where we just ask people, you know, do you want to update your estimate? Right? Um, so that's one set of studies that I have a link to that paper, um, which is uh, up online uh, at the end of the talk. We are also, of course, really interested in doing this with experts. Um, and so we are piloting studies. We have some great results so far with um, interviews with doctors on how they perceive these things, uh, for instance, for uh, different medical treatments when shown results in different ways. That's with uh, 
Patrick Heck, Michelle Meyer, and Chris Rebri at Guiding Our Health. Um, so we're really excited about this and hope to have this out soon. Um, so that's the set of work I wanted to cover. Um, I think I'll take just a few minutes and kind of try to give some higher level thoughts and then we can, we can take a bunch of questions. Um, so parting thoughts. First, it's, I think it's pretty hard to communicate both statistical significance and effect size of our, even our own studies, right? There's a meta thing going on here. In the paper, we actually made plots of both types for every single plot. It's very onerous. We have standard error plots and standard deviation plots, and it's a pain to read, but we felt that we would really hammer the point home uh, by doing this. So even in our own study on visualizing effect sizes, uh, it's hard to communicate statistical significance and effect size. Um, and I'll give some thoughts on ways to do that maybe more efficiently. And then the second part is that um, we know that existing results are already biased towards, uh, you know, there's already a file drawer and publication bias. And the combination of overestimates for, from past studies plus perceptual biases and how people receive those overestimates, I think is particularly dangerous. Um, so this is something nice that, that Dan has pointed out um, that, that I'll say something about in just a moment. So on the first point, um, you know, if you look at both of these, right, I think it's just, it's difficult to hold them both in your head as the same thing, right? They look very different. And I think also when you're submitting to a journal and you're looking for that high impact result, right, this thing says high impact result to the reviewers and the editor, right? No, no doubt when you look at this, you know, it's very tempting to say, yeah, we're really sure this difference, um, you know, is, is surprising, right? It's not due to chance. Um, but I think this is the more honest thing, especially when we're in a regime where we have lots and lots of data and we can make these, uh, you know, error bars, this inferential uncertainty really low. I think, you know, we should start to focus on the underlying effect sizes, um, because a lot of times that has more of a practical significance than, uh, you know, than the inferential uncertainty. Uh, not always. There are certainly policy s settings where you might care about this. For instance, right, uh, uh, COVID is is, an, is a situation where you really might care about this. You're going to say, if I'm a policymaker, and I, you know, even if there's a small effect and it's real, I I'm still interested, uh, even if at the individual level there's lots of variability. So I don't think it's always the case that you should just show this. There there are times where you want to represent both pieces of information. Um, but I think it is hard to keep them in your head as, as the same thing. Uh, Dan has made this nice analogy to say, look, you know, this is kind of like the Necker cube where, you know, do you think this is the front face or do you think this is the front face, right? It's, it's sort of two different ways to perceive the same thing. But in this case, you have a strong incentive to maybe, maybe stick with the one on the left uh, because of systemic problems in, in, you know, in the publication world. Um, the second, so, you know, how do, how do we do better, right? Um, Mike asked this question. Here's one example mirroring what I showed with the heights. This is not something we had a chance to test in that original paper because we uh, ended up with so many participants just testing the conditions we did. But here you're seeing the individual points uh, represented by the gray dots um, and, uh, and the means and standard errors represented by the black dots and the error bars, right? And so here, I think you have sort of full information um, and I think this is a particularly kind of promising situation. Sometimes, of course, you'd have to sample down to get, uh, to get a reasonable number of points here, for instance. But I think this is one version. Um, the, there are some folks, after we did this work, um, unrelated, and I was very pleasant, uh, pleased to find this in Nature Methods, um, there's a site called Estimation Stats that does a very similar thing here. They'll show you outcomes from the control, outcomes from the treatment, an estimate of the treatment minus the control with a 95% confidence interval on that effect size estimate, which I think is quite nice. Um, and so uh, I would encourage people to check that out. I think, of course, you know, Bayesian analogs of that would be nice. And Matt Kay, if people are familiar with Matt, he's the author of the Tidy Bayes package and a friend of ours. Um, we had a great online discussion asking for better ways to do this. Mark, Mark Whiting was the one who pointed out estimation stats and Matt pointed out a bunch of things he's done um, where he's showing, you know, samples of, uh, you know, different distributions, predictive intervals and uh, inferential intervals, you know, uh, on the same plot. And so I think, I think these are really nice. Um, I would encourage people uh, to check out all of these things to, to present uh, their own results to others. Um, and then I just want to touch on this second point, this second part about how we perceive effects. So, um, you know, here, I think the idea that when the replication crisis really got pretty serious in the early 2010s, uh, 
um, you know, I think people were surprised, right? People were surprised and, you know, Nozick et al. in the Open Science Collaboration Study, where um, I think most people have probably seen this, but if not, they, they replicated 100 psychology studies. So they took um, 100 different studies and, that were published and they tried to replicate them. Um, here is, uh, this is from their appendix and slightly modified, so you see probability of superiority um, on the x-axis instead of our squared that they showed, but uh, there's a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, of the studies that they looked at, here is the distribution, the CDF of effect sizes. Um, and what they found in the original studies was that the median uh, study had a probability superiority of 70%, right? Um, when they replicated, they found that the median study had a probability superiority of 57%. And this again is another kind of funny accident in that that happens to coincide with what we tested. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a big drop, right? So, so if you look at all of the original studies, only two of them had a probability of superiority below 57%. And when they replicated, half of them did, right? So that itself is surprising that these published results are overestimates. But if you think about the effect of now looking at one of these that was that, let's say, a 70%, probability of superiority. And imagine the biasing effect of seeing the means and standard errors presented in there. You know, they were probably perceived as being somewhere out here, right? And so you might have had something that, you know, three quarters of the time, like, produces a better outcome, but people thought it was nearly 100% of the time, like in the high 90s or something like that, right? And so I think this is this sort of adds to why people might think um, you know, these, these lack of replication or, or certain treatments are not as effective as they thought, why it was so surprising, right? Because there was both, um, you know, a publication bias and a perceptual bias that probably inflated our sense of what things looked like, uh, you know, out to here when they were really down here. Um, and so just to wrap up, um, you know, in case I haven't said this enough times, it's easy to overestimate effect sizes when looking at scientific results, um, especially when you use means and standard errors or you represent inferential uncertainty. I think displaying outcome variability really helps, it's something we should do more of, um, you know, in, in terms of thinking about results that are out there, that 57% of probability of superiority. Uh, it is like the typical, you know, the median effect size in psychology, right? Um, that's not a very strong effect. It's a Cohen's D of a quarter. I think the 57% is maybe easier to understand, but you can hold in your head that it's the probability that a 16-year-old is, is taller than a 15-year-old. Um, so with that, I think I will wrap up and take questions. Um, there, both papers are up online at these links, and I just wanted to, uh, again, thank my co-authors, Dan, Jessica, and Ye Sol, as well as our RAs, uh, Will and Jenny, who did lots of the front-end uh, work to get all of our experiments up and running with all the triggers. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, and uh, hopefully we have some time for questions. Uh, Mike, if there are some, some questions, or David, uh, sure. I want to read out from folks. Yeah, thanks very much, Jake, for a great talk. Uh, so I'll just... And, and... For all of the participants that are still online, please enter your questions in the Q&A box. I'll start with uh, one of the first. We have a few. I think you can see those questions, Jake, but I'll read, read it for the people that are watching this talk recorded who can't see the text. So it, the first question here is, in any application I have in mind, do you mostly care about option A being better than option B, which is answered by standard error? Uh, inherent variation of distribution is informative, but it's uh, it's more political. It's more of a political piece of information. So the question yeah. in the comment here is, given the variation, is the difference big enough to switch? So what are your thoughts on that comment? Yeah, so I, I think this really matters. And I think it's a great point. And I, I think it's kind of to this, this thing I, I mentioned about, you don't always just want to show outcome variability and ignore, um, you know, inferential uncertainty. I don't, I'm not, I don't mean to suggest that that's the answer. Um, and I think when it is uh, a situation where you care about mean effects, even if they're small, if they're real, you care about them, then by all means, go ahead and talk about the inferential uncertainty, right? So, so COVID would be a perfect example. Um, but, um, and, and, and so that's a, that's a case where you say, look, A, a is better than B. I don't care really how much better a is than B, because I'm going to, you know, let's say I, I do an A-B test, and I'm going to run with whichever one is better forever, right? Um, then, you know, 
just pick the better one and go with it. Um, but I think if you're talking about individual level decisions, right? So if you're talk if you're thinking instead about somebody who has to make the, their own choice about should I pay for this medical treatment to improve my condition, and what I care about is really my own outcome. You know, should I pay and how much should I pay? I think that outcome variability matters very much. Okay. Okay. Cool. And then the second question here from Nicola Chopin. So what about box plots? In certain fields, they're quite common and they tend to represent properly the spread of the considered variables. So yeah, I, th I think box plots are a nice, a nice choice as well. Um, I think, uh, you know, in this case, you know, we tried sort of the minimal set um, in order to exhaustively explore what we could with the Turkers, but I think box plots would be would be very nice, especially for the right audiences. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? I'm looking over here. Um, I think that was in the Q and A. I don't know, Mike or David, if you have anything else, or or no, we're almost out of time actually. I, I have one of my own. Well, we don't have a room, so then we'll throw us out. I have one of my own. Um, maybe bring it back to Bayes and, and A-B testing, where we're doing these sorts of tests. And actually, the, the, the language we use is always, is it positive, negative, or neutral? So we're, we're using the, the language of significance. And by kind of the frequentist rule book, we're breaking the rules always, I would say, because we always look. We're always peaking early and it, it's actually, I think what you're talking about is maybe touching on like stopping rule paradoxes, which come a lot in Bayesian inferences. Um, do you have anything to say about this? Is it, do you think it could impact on kind of ways to resolve these stopping rule? Um, because it's, it's a bizarre thing where someone's saying you can't look at, you can't look at the result. Um, well, from a Bayesian perspective, it's a bizarre thing to say you can't look at the result because it's changing the stopping rule. Um, and then that's going to change your your p value. Yeah, um, that's interesting. I don't know that I have anything super concrete to say about it in terms of a real recommendation. Um, I do know that there I have seen a really nice paper um, that's actually from like the marketing world where they consider a setting uh, of doing a flight, but it's with a finite horizon. So this I'm I'm kind of. My answer is I kind of don't have a good answer to your question, but I'm gonna pivot a little bit to something related that I think you might find interesting. <laughs> um, so there's a there's a nice paper, what's that? It's always the best way to answer questions. The best way to answer a question. So I'm gonna answer it that way. Um, so there's a nice, question, a nice paper from some marketing folks where they said, look, you know, if you're gonna run an A-B test um, and then you're, you have an infinite horizon, then you know you care about about this uh you know which one is better but if you have a finite horizon now you've got a trade-off uh you know you get into like a vanity type of setting um and say uh you know how long am i willing to experiment at the expense of exploiting and what they do is a really nice thing which is to say calculate the size of the flight based uh, on effect size right not on statistical significance this idea that you would run you would need to run a huge flight um, to, to see if there's a small difference. Uh, you can get away with a much smaller one when you're considering the explore exploit trade-off, assuming you don't have any other vanity or, or fancy stuff available to you. And so I think it's sort of a hybrid answer to your question because it says, hey, you know, if you look and consider effect size, you might run a very different experiment. So it's not the early stopping question, but I think it, it could inform uh, the types of things people do every day.